<laughs> All right, so let me let me get the ball rolling. So, okay, um, Lee Scoggins here at Source AV, and, and we're here with Jason Lord, and we're interviewing him as well. He's uh, lent us the space for the uh, prior Mark Spitz uh, interview. But Jason himself is kind of an interesting character, as it turns out. He's done some interesting things, and I'm going to try and coax a story or two out of him. But uh, let me just ask a couple of questions, and hopefully, Jason, you can expand on the themes. But uh, you've worked with Eric Clapton. That's that doesn't suck. You did some front of the house work for front Eric. Front of house, yeah. So t tell me about that. What does what does front of house mean? And well, you ha what did you do back in those days? So, so front of house is pretty easy to explain. You see that when you go to a concert, you see the guy that's kind of in the middle of the room, sort of back in mm -hmm. the, in, on the floor seating. Yeah. And uh, that guy is the front of house engineer. So he's the one that's giving you the sound that you hear. Mm -hmm. There's also a guy on the stage or the side of the stage that's giving the musicians what they hear. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that's a, that's a stage monitor guy. And I'm the front of the house guy, so that's how that works. Okay. But the concert business is pretty interesting. Yeah, I spent a, probably, I, I think, just a little over 25 years in that industry. Uh, and it was really rewarding, both financially and, you know, in terms of accomplishing things. And so learning how to mix sound for an 80,000 seat arena mm. is, uh, is something that you kind of learn doing that kind of stuff. And I think... Uh, I think my first big concert that I did that on was uh, probably in or about 20,000 seats. And learning how to keep a good solid mix in, in that environment is really hard. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, you know, all that, you know, uh, you know having, come, having started out my life as an electrical engineer and, and, and studying acoustics, that kind of helped. But, but actually doing the sound in bizarre rooms that were, really weren't designed for that kind of stuff mm -hmm. is what kind of lends to my ability to do what I do now, which is you know, coming out of retirement and doing this with my brother um, has been fun. But because of that history in doing concerts, I can walk into a room and I can instantly see what's wrong or hear what's wrong mm -hmm. and, and almost immediately know how to fix it. Sometimes there's an anomaly I may have to chase down, but mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, it, it gives me that advantage. I can walk into a theater and a customer may be telling me there's complaints about it, mm -hmm. and, and I may not know anything about it because it may be somebody else's job, mm -hmm. and maybe they're asking my opinion to how to rectify a situation or something, And I, but I can instantly walk into a room and tell you almost exactly what's wrong. I could probably walk into your house and tell you what suggestions I would make on it. It doesn't mean you're doing something right or wrong. It just means that that would be based on my experiences. Right, yeah. No, that's that's fantastic. Any interesting stories about working with Eric Clapton and the various band members? Anything? So Eric was, working for Eric was interesting in a great many ways, but, you know, you don't, you get to, you get to interface with them, but it, it's, you're in that particular job, uh, it wasn't like a brotherhood. So if I if we go from you know from Eric and we move over to Brian Adams, I worked with Brian Adams for a while, mm -hmm. and that was like a brotherhood. Everybody was like mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, right? And so you get in there, you go to these bars, and you're in Canada, and everybody's smoking cigarettes and eating prime rib, you know, <laughs> cigarettes here, prime ribs here, and, mm -hmm. and and I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. So even in the United States, where back in those days when people smoked and ate, it was typically they smoked after they ate. Right. <laughs> when I went to Canada and they were smoking and eating simultaneously. That's different. I, I felt like I was in a completely different culture that I couldn't quite get my head around. Yeah. So some of that stuff was pretty fun. Brian Adams is uh, the band I was working for when I broke my back. And that was just because a, a flown array of speakers came down after a show. And oh, gosh. the corner of it nailed me in the back. And that's where I broke my back in 93. And that's what got me out of the concert business. Uh -huh. I was in a wheelchair for a couple of years and then... They kind of told me I would never walk again, and then those people that know me will know this is true. I'm just too mean to, to accept no for an answer. Yep, <laughs> well, that's a good thing. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, I put together a team of doctors and came back into the business. But I'm a bassist, and I used to have my basses made at a store in the San Fernando Valley mm -hmm. here in L.A. Um, at a place called Valley Arts, and it and a lot of us, uh, you know, studio musicians, live musicians, we all kind of would go there because that's where all the hot tip guys. Mm -hmm. So guys that 
um, that are a little bit my senior guys, like uh, Larry Carlton, for example. I think I mentioned him to you. Yeah, yeah. He came from, I, I want to say it was Torrance or North High, and I went from South High. So we came from the same city, and, mm -hmm. and even though I was, uh, I think I was a freshman when he was getting out of high school. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was always very friendly to all the local guys that were up and coming. And, uh, and as a bassist, you know, since I wasn't a competitor, I was a bassist, not a guitarist. Mm -hmm. um, he actually sort of helped me get into doing session work. So I did a few TV commercials and sessions like that, and you know, with his help. And that kind of, that's what got me into the music business and sort of took me into um, doing front of house sound. Okay, yeah, I saw, I think I mentioned to you, I saw Larry Carlton play at a small jazz club in Alpharetta, Georgia. Nice guy. Recently. Unbelievable performance. Um, it, we were, we're blessed with a, it's actually in a strip mall, believe it or not, just a small venue, but terrific sound. Right. Actually, had a THX engineer design. It's called the Velvet Note for those of you in uh, Georgia or <laughs> nearby. But, um, you know, he was one of the great session players that did a lot of the famous riffs that are on the Steely Dan. Oh, no, Some he played of for... Steely Dan. And he's well beyond Steely Dan. He's, he's just an done some very interesting work. So yeah, he started, I think uh, I think the Crusaders was one of his first uh -huh. bands that he played in that wasn't his band. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's been on a lot of albums. Yeah. And, and so we keep hearing this story. Mark wanted me to ask you about Elon Musk, that there was, you've, you've, uh, you've met some characters in your travels, and there's a funny story around Elon Musk buying I believe some speakers for, from you. What, yeah, what's yeah. that so, all about? So, so yeah. So Elon Musk bought these uh, the speakers from Sonus Faber that are the Aida, which is their. Uh, I think this. I don't think the Sonus Faber, the big, huge, expensive, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar model, was out. But but it, it's a it flagship was, of sorts. But yeah. So he. I. I think apparently he saw an advertisement on a plane ride uh -huh. uh, for the Aida, and he called up his accountant up in San Francisco Bay Area, uh -huh. and I was the only one in the California area that had it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that that accountant called me up and asked me if I had it and, you know, could I get it and, and what was the price, and so I gave him all that information. And so we ended up taking a set of the, um, the red violin color. Oh yeah, beautiful. To his house. Did you check his credit along the way? Because those <laughs> well, are expensive, no, you we, know. We were prepaid. The cash, <laughs> the cash, the check went through, so we were okay on that one. But Shocker. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so we got there and we put him in, and and that's when we found out. Well, one that he wanted three more because he wanted to make a five point one gaming system out of those speakers, not a hi fi, not a surround sound. And the funniest part was walking into the room where he had it, he had a uh, California king size bed sheet hanging, stapled from the ceiling, and that's what his video screen was. And, and he was okay with that. He wanted, and it was a... No Stuart film screen for uh, no, Elon? No, it was just a, it was a bed sheet hanging off the ceiling, and it was, <laughs> uh, and it was uh, I, I'm trying to remember the brand. I can't remember the name of the brand of the, a, a really, like a $2,000 uh, conferencing vid, uh, projector. Oh boy. And that was his video source for his gaming. You know, gaming, you want, you want some speed in your processor, right? And you want to be able to see things. And it, it was, it was, it was doom and gloom. It was a horrible picture, but, but obviously he wanted the Aida. So mm -hmm. we ended up getting him all five and, and we just, we just kind of said to the, he, he had a house girl. I don't know. I don't know her title and I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't remember her name, but and so we said, hey, these speakers are showing. If you look in the manual, they say 300 watts nominal. And if you're a very quiet listener and all you have is 300 watts, you can make the speaker make noise. But it's not the right amplifier range. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need six to 1200 watts. And she goes, okay, make a recommendation. And I said, okay, would you like it to come out good, better, best? And she goes, yeah. So I. Sent her, I think at the time, a Macintosh 601. In the same email, we sent her some information about uh, the 1.25. And then at the bottom of that, I sent her some information about the two KWs. And are those, I, those like three amplifiers that three are chassis? stacked in the other room, the three chassis? Yeah, the three chassis unit, yeah. And so only you can only buy those from a reference dealer. Yeah. So, 
Uh, but in any case, uh, we gave her the three models. She felt that we were coming to, this, to the table just trying to pull money out of his pocket. Mm -hmm. And I said, you can buy any of the three models, but any of these three models will not harm the speaker, right? Needless to say, she ended up going to another dealer and buying another brand of amplifiers. Uh, it's an American company, but that particular amplifier was made in China. Mm -hmm. And it was known for being a torch. In other words, its output level on the back end, when you got anywhere past 250 watts, it was a 500 watt per channel amp. Once you got past 250 watts, you were just getting into insane distortion levels. Mm. And you know, while speakers don't like too much power, they like a whole lot of distortion less, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, <laughs> he ended up taking that amplifier, putting it, the front end was still a Denon audio video receiver, right? Hmm. And, and, mm -hmm. and he's pounding, I mean, literally enough to piss off an entire neighborhood block, these Aidas with these cheap ass Chinese, you know, made amplifiers that were just god awful. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think it was three, four, five days later where we got the call and there's something wrong with the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that something wrong happened to be that every tweeter was blown. The front and back firing oh, tweeters. Oh boy, yeah. Every mid-range was blown. Mm -hmm. It was just smoked something fierce. And, <laughs> and, and, and he was still pounding it. Mm -hmm. He didn't care because he didn't seem to know the difference, right? But it was hilarious in that we had to replace all the tweeters and all the mids on all five Aidas. Oh my goodness. So by the time he got done, and you know, the, the, there was no warranty offered on that because it was customer abuse. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it was Elon Musk. So, you know, mm. we knew, everybody knew he had the money to pay for it. So he ended up buying all their mid-range and tweeters and we had to drop them in and it was just, they went right back to that same amplifier. Now, we haven't heard a word since he might have gotten smart and bought a good amplifier from somebody, but I, I he was so. his own worst enemy. And, yeah. and for some reason.